and welcome to the Dr. Tech Tech Talk Show, where myself, Pauline Roach, and Swain Hunter, and occasional guests, guide you through the world of online communications, a show which was the brainchild of the late, great internet evangelist, John Popham. Um, so let's start with the usual question. We welcome our, our special guests this week, who are uh, Paul Clayton and Casper Kennerdale, and let's ask each of them, Paul and Casper, how, Paul, how's the weather where you are? It's literally, the sun has just started coming out a little bit, but it's been a bit grim and grey. Mm-hmm. And so Casper, what about yourself? It was pretty damp and wet this morning, but I'm kind of um, just looking out the window, same as Paul really, which isn't really that far away. Uh-huh. Well, you've got, got a nice bright orange t-shirt on, so that brightens up the the uh, the day all, all together. And Swain, Pos- what about yourself? How's the weather where you are? Oh, you're on mute. First mute of the day. <laughs> Hooray. That's two weeks in a row, I think. Mm-hmm. Anyway, after, uh, 700 miles north, we're having a wonderful, lovely, calm, sunny day after we ha- after the rain took away a whole week's worth of snow yesterday. We've had all sorts of snow and wintry weather over the last uh, week or so, with tractors and diggers out clearing roads, ambulances getting stuck, buses going off the road. You name it, we've had it. But uh, today, it's a beautiful day and all this, mostly all of the snow has gone. How about you? Now, in Birmingham, it's uh, bright anyway. I um, haven't been out yet. It was raining at the weekend, so I was glad not not to be going out. Um, but I uh, maybe maybe we'll get a chance for a trot out later today, uh, as long as the uh, rain stays off. One of our previous uh, guests on the show, Madeline Sugden, has been uh, tweeting about uh, I think she's making an ice uh, during during you know this this time, and she's made some beautiful coloured um, things with leaves and flowers and stuff like that. So that's a nice thing to have a look at if you've got any um, interest in that sort of thing. Um, so we'll uh, carry on as usual and talk about the thing, kind of things we're celebrating at this time of year. Um, and uh, one thing that's on Tuesday, the 16th of February, is something called Innovation Day, which I hadn't heard of before. Uh, and this is the um, Science History Institute. It's a US thing, I think. Science History, History Institute, in conjunction with the Society of Chemical Industry, regularly band together to host Innovation Day. And this holiday was created to help bring attention to those who weren't just producing technology, but those who were pushing the envelope <clears throat> on what could be done and what was possible. Um, and in this show, we kind of go to both ends of the spectrum of what the kind of more advanced stuff is and also some easier stuff or things that we, we might consider easier but are important to people. Anyway, these two organizations know that every new invention and every new step forward is based on the work done um, by the innovators of the past. And this is true today and will continue to be true in the future. And companies um, held, hold innovation days throughout the year, really trying to find in opportunities to gain, get great ideas from all people in their infrastructure. And what sets these innovators apart is they look at present knowledge, technology, and see beyond their present applications. Um, as society changes, the use of technology changes with it, even existing technology. And then on Wednesday, the 17th of February, is Random Act of Kindness Day, um, which a lot of the things we talk about on here could also be seen as Random Acts of Kindness. And this was first a day first created in Denver, Colorado in 1995 by a small nonprofit organization, the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation. And nine years later, it spread to New Zealand in 2004. And these random acts of kindness can, can include just about anything, including something as simply, simply as taking a tray of muffins to work. So that's one example. And I think helping people with their IT and technology can also be seen as often we do as uh, random acts of kindness. And the other, one of their hashtags is explore the good. So that's good to hear about. We can, we can have a look at that during the week. And on Friday, I heard about an event coming up that uh, might be of interest to us and other people listening to the show. Um, it's it's a called Ro- More Than Robots Meetup. Um, apparently, this is a regular sort of thing, but it's the first time I've heard of it. Um, and this one on Friday, the 19th, uh, talks about digital and social media being essential elements for anyone supporting or working with children and young people. But how in this rapidly changing area do we stay relevant? What's effective? How do we manage risks and safeguard participants while we embrace the opportunities of digital? How do we ensure true participation? 
So the meetup is intended for anyone interested in the role of digital in youth participation, engagement and support in any sector. And it's an opportunity to discuss real examples of what does and doesn't work, meet colleagues working on similar challenges and share useful research, news or updates. So I've signed up for that. And uh, yeah, they have presentations. Um, Swain's got on screen now. Presentations include from Wi-Fi connections to human connections, Lessons from blended to co-production with care experienced young people, bridging the gaps between digital policy process and practice to improve outcomes for young people, adoption connections, uh, COVID-19 supporting parents, adolescents and children during epidemics, and children's views of online safety learning. That one sounds really interesting because I think often we think we're doing some brilliant um, training or, or learning or teaching and the person that we're trying to reach says actually there's a better way of doing that. And if they're polite about it, if they're not, they might say something more rude, but um, yeah. So that sounds really good. So as I say, we've got two um, special guests today, uh, both of whom have been on the show before. We're delighted that they were able to come back and join us again today together this time. And um, because they do do some work together and we'd like to hear more about that from them. But Paul Clayton uh, has been on the show three times before. Um, and as we said about him before, he's creative, self-taught and motivated individual with working experience as a teacher, salesperson, internet technical support analyst, art worker, factory worker and other roles in a variety of service industries and uh, has honed his community engagement skills, working with art groups in West Sussex and South East London. And Casper Kennerdale is passionate about digital inclusion, keeping things simple and building confidence and set up Clear Community Web, a South London based social enterprise dedicated to developing digital skills in older people, vulnerable adults and carers. So you're both very welcome on the show today. Hi. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for coming on. So we were having a chat earlier, um, Casper particularly uh, kind of initiated this one about email addresses and finding and retaining and refinding your email address. Casper, would you um, tell us a bit about what, what you've been talking about that recently? Well, I, I, I guess there's kind of two things really. I think firstly, um, I kind of, about a year ago, kind of framed email addresses as actually possibly one of the most important administrative tools that we have and and the reason I came to this was because in classes the concept and of how to manage email how to find email but also being able to recover kind of access to to accounts requires an email address so it kind of seemed to me uh, on one hand an obvious you'd think an obvious statement but on the other hand you know actually th these were things that you aren't necessarily taught and you've got to kind of stumble your way through and again kind of comes back into this area around kind of confidence so I've been kind of reframing email as this kind of administrative um, kind of thing and, I, and when I looked at my own email address I actually realized that I've had my personal email address longer than I've had a passport and because it is my own domain um, the chances are that you know unless I change my name and I forget to renew it I'm going to always have that so actually I could have my email address for 40 years um, potentially 50 years maybe longer um, and when you consider kind of things like you know passports ID and stuff like that you know kind of access that that's almost like my you know I don't need to use the word crown jewels but it, but it kind of really is so when you kind of think about that you then start to think about really trying to um, encourage people to have a real strategy around number one protecting that and number two realizing the importance of it but number three this this function of being able to work with with email to kind of give you access to things um and i think so the other thing that's kind of relates to that is a kind of conversations that kind of paul and i have had about you know what are the real questions to ask and what what's the real thing we're trying to do when we we're, we're helping with someone and one of the things i noticed that in, in the past a very common question is whether or not you know someone has an email address um but i find a more um useful question is asking that same person if they use email because then you know having an email doesn't necessarily mean you know how to use it knowing how to use it means that you might have some you know other tools within you to be able to set up an account or or get access to an old account or or be able to communicate to and forth with you know with myself or, or with with anyone else um yes that the, they were the points mm. i think that's that's something that we often 
take for granted, don't we, that that it's uh, that it's come naturally, um, and and really it doesn't. And and it reminded me when we were talking about it earlier, um, of this book that I've just um taken uh delivery of this week, uh, the Librarian by uh, Ali Morgan, um. It's a memoir, and the the subtitle is the the library saved her. Now she wants to save the library, and in it she talks a lot about um, the kind of basic help that uh, a lot of people working in libraries have been have, have been giving to people to get online and to use online services for a long time. I'm sure you both know that. Um, yeah, it's just it's just been published, so and I highly recommend it. It's um, I thought it was going to be a, kind of a romp through kind of nice, gentle, funny stories about working in libraries, and actually, it is stories about working in libraries. But libraries have been on the front line, I think, of inclusion for an awful long time, um, and yeah. um, have been the places where people who felt disengaged or disenfranchised uh, found a natural home because you don't have to pay to go there public libraries you don't have to pay um you don't have to uh, you don't have to buy anything when you're there you do, you know you can use the, all the services freely under the 1964 um libraries act which is um still in in existence and um you know um these the local authorities have to provide a public library service uh and some are better than others and we can have that conversation maybe another day. But um, I wonder, I wonder if maybe one of the questions that we need, to, those of us who are doing this digital inclusion work, need to be asking people is, have you used your public library, and how have you used, it and how have people in public libraries helped you? Because I think people there have, and it it often is the, mm -hmm. the first step. And as I say, the stories in this book um, are a lot about getting people online for the first time or helping people retrieve their uh, email addresses like you've just mm. said been saying um casper um and stuff like that and um uh, shopping and you know and, and using uh, um you know government services dwp and job centers and so on do send people to libraries to to for help and you know obviously those a lot of those libraries are closed now so it's going to be more difficult for people who who, who have already already found it difficult um Paul, you've—I think we talked before about libraries and people and engagement you've had with people through libraries. Um, have you had any of that recently? Has it has it come no, up again? No, the libraries are very shut, mm. and um, that's really gone to one side. Um, it's been problematic because um, one of the projects I've been working on, uh, re I really rely on public spaces to actually meet people. Mm. Um, we've had as the tiers have changed so quickly on some occasions have been pulling small groups of people together but having to meet in coffee shops um, which is okay um, but then when they get shut I've got nowhere and so mm. it's been really problematic. Library Libraries have been really historically the best places to go for this scenario to be honest. Um, I once volunteered in my local library to help them out and I found it really really very strange that the librarians were pushed in every single way to help them out as tech support on the spot as well there was no 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 trainer there for the i mean what they pushed normally is the my web my way um no sorry learn my way i apologize yeah. yes mm -hmm. uh, learn my way uh, service and that needs support that needs someone to get onto the machine. I, I was finding that the librarians would actually just get people onto it. <laughs> and I just thought, well, this is, the, you're, you're, they're going to fail miserably when they're on their own at, yeah. at, at any point. But that was what their time limitation gave them. And that's yeah. what they were able to do. They're incredibly helpful people to, mm. uh, to a man, to a person. Mm. Never found them. They've always been some of the loveliest people I've met. Um, in civil in civil service generally really mm. that's really good to hear and i i know my colleagues uh, in libraries will be very pleased to hear that i mean um, all our work actually started it started as a pilot in the upper norwood library hub which is with a community run library um and that's got a dynamic of its own because the the librarian service is is run by by a council but the building and it's on it has a, a you know limited resource and the, the, the building is run by, you know, by, by a kind of a trust mm. that then does kind of events, and classes and, and kind of stuff like that. And, and I think the, you know, right where we are, you, you know, unfortunately, Croydon 
council, uh, which is on just on that side of the road, um, you know, is kind of facing, you know, huge difficulties. And, you know, there's a imminent sort of loss of three libraries um, this year um, if consultation um, doesn't goes in the wrong direction. Um, and I think it, I think the, the interesting point about libraries is really is as much around the reason for people going there. And there is a social element as well. You know, in our library, there's quite a few people that, that, that kind of socialize in the library and use the internet services in the library as part of a package. Mm -hmm. And they consciously do not have or want internet at home because they want to manage their their access, their, their use of it. They want to, you know, keep it kind of ring fenced, which is, which is fine. But there's something about the experience and the, the social experience of kind of going to, going to that space. Um, so you know, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you about uh, how, you, how you both met because um, it was actually through Paul uh, that we, we heard about you, Casper. Paul introduced us to you, um, which we were very pleased about and we're very delighted to have you on again, both of you. But if you could um, if you could tell us a bit about how you met, because I think um, sometimes uh, people working in this space tend to be, you know, work ahead and, and kind of uh, are not aware or, 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 or just get on, with, get on with the job and don't aren't aware of the networks that are out there. But you, you guys managed to kind of link up with each other. Um, so it'd be good to hear about how you managed that. Paul, if you'd like to start, because you were the, the, did the introduction in the first place. I did. I, I stumbled on Casper, uh, as it were, um, in various communications in the area, to be honest. Um, and I think uh, I, I wasn't, I was always, I'm always interested in anyone else who's doing anything similar to me or even somewhat different uh, in the same space, shall we say. So um, I, I just, uh, basically just emailed Casper and start from there just said here I am here I know you're over there so I'm over here and that was that really um it, we, we sort of been and we've got an understanding that we do very similar things I was actually um I was really pleased as we uh, had a, an ongoing conversation that we very much fit into the same sort of attitudes and ethos of how we work and that's a that's a really good thing. Casper, what was it like? What was it like for you to have Paul reach out and make contact like that? Um, well, I thought, I think as I, um, what I, when I've kind of started um, my kind of social enterprise, one of the things that really attracted me to that method of working was the like a genuine collaboration opportunities, or and and not even a but kind of working with people that aren't um, necessarily kind of competitors and seeing the kind of the competition element, which is what, you know, I've had in, you know, previous industries and stuff is kind of having a real glass ceiling around things and always can be very restrictive. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, me finding out and just constantly just seeing who else is out there, I'd heard of Paul, um, heard of, well, Soul Chip anyway. Um, and so, yeah, no, it was pleasantly, um, you know, it was it was a nice surprise for someone to reach out, reach out to me for a change, because you kind of seem to like reach out to other people quite a lot. And, you know, um, and again, as Paul said, to kind of actually meet someone that, you know, you know, not not trying to not trying to sell to, to each other, not trying to get, you know, just kind of having a, um, a nice kind of conversation where I feel we can just run ideas by each other and stuff as well. Mm. And, you know, obviously looking for opportunities where we can kind of either incorporate each other in work or kind of just be a, a watchful kind of guardian of each other. Um, I think all of those things could work nicely and they don't necessarily need to be, you know, and I think hopefully that's going to shift and evolve over time. Mm. So um, are you working on anything uh, together at the moment? Are you planning something or how, how is it? How is it going? Well, um We've been talking about um, the potential of uh, providing a service between us, but it's all a little bit vague at the moment. Um, we're both trying to um, work out what's going... Well, I'm trying to work out what my next steps are after this project that I'm doing at the moment. And I'm really keen to just expand upon the project, what I'm doing. Um, I'm thinking about... We're getting drawn into te technical support arenas to be honest um mm. and it seems that that's a a really valid place to be when people are struggling 
um, I sent Swain a uh, link to my latest post, which is basically a collation of a lot of work I've been doing uh, as of late. Mm. And um, it's, it's something that myself and um, uh, doing printables is something I've talked about with Casper. It's just creating materials that actually are physical and hoping that organisations can actually print them out and send them out. Yeah. So I've been looking at services that will actually um, do that for you. You can actually send them to a, a service and those, they'll actually post it on. And I think it costs about 50-odd P, which mm. is quite nice. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really looking at how to bridge a few gaps in terms of, of what we need to be doing because I think myself – Casper, you can um, tell me if I'm wrong, but if you've only got one device and you, you get instructions on screen, then it's yeah. complicated. You've just added another layer of complexity there. So it's a list so, of um, um, a list I of mean, guides of how to do how yeah. tos, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I've got another one waiting in the wings for about uh, getting to your doctor online. Uh, GP online, but um, I've opened a Pandora's box with online GP access. Um, I'm finding all is not as as it should be. Okay. Hmm. Are you able to say any more about that? Oh yeah, if you want, I can keep on going for the next hour, but I'll shorten it down. Right. So what happened is that I found that uh, what you get sent out in many instances is just a shopping list of providers for a GP. So the GP hasn't actually recommended a particular provider and nor does the NHS. Um, then there's the other issue if um, things change. So I've, I've got one gentleman I'm working with who's, who's been using a web-based service and uh, all of a sudden the GP said, oh, it's not working on, on some front, some aspect of it isn't working. So what they've done is just changed to an app on a smartphone, which he doesn't have without telling him. Mm. And it's really interesting. I find it really interesting that you basically all you're getting in terms of online access is a list. And then when things change, you don't get any discussion. There's, you're not involved in that situation. If a bit, I mean, I know GPs are effectively a business and any other business that would do that, you would just leave them. So if you're redesigning the um, service, Paul, what would you be, um, how would you be doing it? Well, firstly, I would be creating lists as appropriate to what the actual GP practice is doing, not just a whole bunch of them. And this is also part of the problem. With, there's, there's a little bit of politic here going on about the NHS innovation, mm. because I was also, um, I was actually party to a research um, I, was, I was asked a load of questions about the innovation pathways in, into the NHS. And I really, I, I went at them <laughs> because there was no accessibility as a criteria in, in this. This should have been the first part of it, not just come on board, the water's fine. Um, I just saw, come on in, it's an, it, we're all going to innovate together. And I just thought, well, wait a minute, what are you trying to do? What, what is this? So now you've got a whole bunch of other services. So I think the NHS uh, needs to have a, a more defined protocol for what services. And that should be very clear, but it's not. Okay. Um, hmm. okay we, might, um, we might try and um, expand on that in a future program. It sounds like something that we should, we should look into a bit more. Um, Casper, you've been doing some work with um, Digital Unite recently. We, we met on a on a on a, on a another Zoom call, um, actually teaching people, uh, or teaching people who are teaching people, isn't it, how to use Zoom? Was that was that the the gist of it? I, I think yes. Yeah, so, but I, I think the 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 gist was to kind of show, to give ideas on how um, you can, you know, assist people to use Zoom. Why you should use Zoom. Um, and some, I guess, creative ideas into kind of using it differently. Um, and I, the reason I, I mean, I 
started to use Zoom in our classes right at the beginning of lockdown. And at the time I was kind of in contact with Digital Unite and I, I'd known Zoom as a platform before. Mm. Um, and so therefore at the time compared to other, other platforms that were a little bit more um, costly, um, um, like go to webinar and stuff like that. Zoom seemed an obvious one for me. And at the time, um, you know, there were certain things that I liked about it and other things. So we had to, if you like, plump for a platform for our teaching. And lo and behold, at the same time, um, you know, I was also asked to um, assist with some other organizations using Zoom and then, you know, more or less overnight, 90% of Eventbrite seemed to be on, on Zoom over, over and above anything else. So I, I think from Digital Unite's perspective, I was a kind of an early adopter, mm. um, even though I'd, I'd actually used that for quite a while before um, and had been just, just have been successfully um, kind of running kind of social events, classes on there. And I think that the, the underlying message was to try and, yeah, try to make it as a social exercise as possible, try to bring bridge the kind of the gap of technology, make people feel as if they're kind of in a room. But by doing that, you're kind of experiencing the technology. So it's less of a it's less of a learning opportunity um, or, it is, or it's a learning opportunity by stealth, if mm -hmm. you like, um, if you can kind of get people onto it. Um, so I think what they, they invited me on to kind of almost give a, you know, nine months on kind of what does it look like what what, what have we been doing and, and kind of how we've been doing it, it you know it, it, it was kind of quite interesting mm. um and i think the kind of the underlying message actually was you know from from my perspective we, we've we've the choice of zoom whilst there was some nice things about it it's an arbitrary decision to some extent it's just a platform um next year we could be doing using some of the new one for me it was the it was about the, the biggest change with the the change in delivery and the opportunities that online kind of delivery kind of gave us um it meant that we could really reevaluate and shift how we were um, um teaching so we can do much more we were much more effective at doing things like demonstrations, whether it is kind of showing websites, how to, how to log into something. And we share screens. We kind of, you know, when we had a, um, we, we were teaching people how to use WhatsApp, for example, and we kind of then shared a screen with our class WhatsApp um, um, f um, on our phone right on the screen there. So people were WhatsApping into it and then they could see it on screens and all of that was kind of quite interesting. And that was stuff that we couldn't necessarily do or do as easily um, when we were in, in, in the community library. Um, the observation was that, you know, what you people kind of come to the class in a whole different r range of, um state so you know they could be on a different they're going to be in a different room they're going to be um you know have a different device they may be on a device that they don't normally use for the internet so all of these things you've got to kind of take on board um and kind of adapt so really our focus was more about so historically the class was was called digital skills for mm -hmm. seniors um, but we shifted the focus to being awareness so it was digital awareness and it means that we could be more informative uh, more you know, showing people what is out there um, a little bit more. Um, but we also noticed that well, where we, the challenge is that we can't actually observe people. Mm. So the big difference between, you know, you know, whether, you know, someone's got restricted mobility on their hands or, you know, whether or not they, they get, you know, um, left and right is, 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 is crossed over and, and all of these things that are, you know, really come to the fore when we're kind of working with people in a classroom. Um, but they're the things that we, we, we you know, we kind of um, are more complex, which then actually then kind of comes back to a very, um, you know, kind of Paul's point about printed material, because what we've, what we've started to do um, with, we've, we've just launched a couple of short courses and within, within, within that came a whole pack of, you know, these are things. And, and actually what we found is that that people kind of, that extra bit of, formality that extra bit of communication from us has meant that their approach and attitude to the classes has kind of it's almost like that kind of, you know straightening your back and kind of you know now I'm concentrating um, I think we've had a kind of nine months of just people turning up to different zooms and stuff like that and I think what's 
what's quite key for for us um, is now you know, the, we, we, we seem to be quite good at the socialization. People kind of come and they come back. But now it's about, okay, how can we kind of, you know, make, um, help people improve? How, and part of that is incentivization. You know, what, what do they, what are they going to get out of it? What do they need out of it? What mm -hmm. do they want versus what they need? Um, and then an another kind of key part of that is kind of really, you know, what, almost like what are the understanding barriers to learning, which, you know, I think, I think we mentioned just before the, before the, um, um, before the lights turned on, we were talking about kind of, you know, people's, um, you know, um, state of mind on that particular day can be mm -hmm. a, you know, huge barrier to them understanding, them communicating, and you being able to kind of, you know, resolve something for someone if you've got a limited amount of time with them. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, Paul's had a fantastic idea that, you know, of, um, you know, literally running a, a course on how to take notes in order to learn, which I thought, you know, the, the framing of that is just kind because, you know, it's that kind of, um, I don't really like the terms responsibility, but it's that kind of, you know, you've got to take, you, you've got to, you know, you, you're, part, you're part of it. It's not for me or Paul or any of us to do everything for you. Um, there are certain elements where there is critical help. But when it's, if it's talking about learning, you've got to want to learn and you've got to do things about, you know, you don't, you know, if you were learning to drive, you, 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 you know, you, you're committed to so many, you know, so much practice in between, for example, you, you know, you, you do some due diligence about who you're, who's going to teach you, mm -hmm. you, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got also got to, um, you don't necessarily have to have quite as rigid a mindset, but, you know, I think that that kind of interests me at the moment is kind of how to, um, we've got them through the doors, but how do we kind of, you know, in a polite way, get them out again? So, you know, <laughs> free up some space for some other people. Well, there's know. there's an opening for you, Paul. We'd love to hear more about this um, this new course that you're coming up with, this suggestion that you've got. OK, he's 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 pitched a good pitch there for <laughs> me. Thanks, Casper. Uh, <laughs> set me up. Um, OK, it's something I've been bubbling around with and playing with for some time and and. Uh, running by people. Um, it's effectively just um, a way of making notes about, well, a digital diary, I think is the best phrase for it. Um, and it's just a way to work through what your goals are and what you're trying to do and if it didn't work and come, revisiting it and coming back to it. Um, what I've been doing lately is trying to, I've found that if you're supporting someone else, uh, my work at the moment is with learning disabilities. And uh, I'm, uh, tomorrow I'm hoping to do a training session with some support workers. And the hope is there to actually try and get them to start doing some of this, to, to start working towards it, because they're the ones who are going to need to be guiding someone else and to pulling someone through. Bless you. So um, the the... The note-taking thing, it's, it's interesting. I've been trying to work on a way of making it really simple and straightforward. Um, I'm really missing what I really miss. And I, 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 this is from our last conversation with myself and Casper, is that I need to work out a way of making overhead videos, top-down videos. Um, my video skills are really, well, average at best. Um, so I'm really needing to learn how to do this so I could actually do it and mix in um, some content to be able to show someone how to build up their own um, note-taking process. I, I thought about trying to do it like a five-day challenge where you just, because I don't do diaries. I, I, historically, I've hated doing diaries. Or rather, I've always wanted to, but never got down to it. I found when I became a teacher, journaling was really part of the job and that was an eye opener and it's been really, really useful. And I think having that form of reflection, like I said, the, 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 the printables I was talking about, I think it's really useful to have something for yourself and have that ownership, create your own materials, find out what your own problems are. Sometimes you have to actually put it down on paper, use the technology that you know already to actually reflect 
what yeah this is something i think we're slightly interrupted with paul's um transmission but i, th I think he made a, a fantastic point of you know use the technology you know already already you know a pen mm -hmm. is yeah, I think it's very easy for us to think about technology as this kind of, you know, euphoric thing of the future or whatever it is, the thing that, you know, you, you must have. But actually, you know, technology is just a change of tools. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an innovation. And, you know, the, the quill, the, you know, the, 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 the bit of charcoal, you know, they, they, they were right there, you know, before the wheel, if you like. Mm. So, you know, and, and using what you understand, um as as your your way of um learning something new seems makes perfect sense um and it, it seems to be something that we've kind of not necessarily forgotten but i think as we as we've got older people get out of the habit of learning um they've forgotten what it is they may not have liked it or or whatever but it's like and i guess trying to trying to stimulate or get that back again mm. um seems very interesting yeah Absolutely. Well, Paul was one of the first people on the show to remind us of the need to use notebooks, you know, to f physical notebooks and pen and uh, Swain. I know that you've uh, made it uh, kind of <laughs> made an impact on you at yeah. the time. Oh, yeah. it did. Mm. Oh, that's nice to know. Yeah. My um, my default reaction to having to take notes is to start up another device and take the notes on that. <laughs> but uh, it's far simpler with a pen, I have to admit. <laughs> Yes, I've got multiple notebooks um, that I uh, then put dates on, so I know I know where, where to go back to. But it is good, and I, with the course, the IT course I've just finished at Fircroft College in Birmingham, um, was definitely notebook based because notebooks aren't going to fail. You know, they're, they're they don't need to have they don't need to have power. They don't need to have uh, anything except you know pen and paper in and you're away. Casper, I know that you can't stay with us to the end of the show, so we're very glad that you were able to stay with us this long. Um, and thanks again to Paul for uh, bringing you to our attention. I know that we uh, have benefited greatly from from it, and we wish you well in your um, ongoing endeavours together and and separately. And we hope that you keep in touch with us and let thanks. us know how you're getting on. Well, thanks for Absolutely. the invite, and um, definitely see you all again soon. Hope to see you soon, Casper. Yes, see thanks, Casper. Take care. Great. So your your um, technology failed slightly there, Paul. Would you you're just coming towards the end of, of describing that the course that you're going to be? Is it actually going to be launched soon, or are you still working on it? I'm still working on it. It's a real work in progress because um, I've been finding there are people who created sort of bullet note taking, and the I found a really nice academic note taking. Uh, Me mechanism or method where you split up a page and I'm thinking of something along those mm. lines but unfortunately when I sit down to do this I start to realize that that there's a support mechanism for others and how that's structured and then the support mechanism for yourself and how that's done um, with if you looked in my notebooks you'll find lots of doodles I'm I'm a real doodler in fact I've been doodling today it's it's one of the ways I listen. It's a really odd mechanism, but it's the way I sort of lock down what I'm doing in this situation. So it's it's very hard for some people to be able to even do that to process on that level. So I'm I'm like I said when I start when I find that way of getting those overhead camera shots reliable, I'll I'll probably start thinking about um, what I can do as a proper course at present. What I've been doing, and historically, I've been throwing the idea of a digital di diary to the groups I've been working with. I've been saying, hey, this is how you can do it. Just do this. Just start with this one thing. Put a date in the corner. Write down what you want, want to do today. And then what happened? Just do that. It hasn't gone well. <laughs> <laughs> It hasn't gone well. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Some people, I think, um, with the digital aspects that they haven't actually, they've lost their, they, they're not really sure what they want. So you have to sort of pull apart, the, they have to pull apart their own aspects first. So I've been thinking, 
this needs a little bit more thought and it probably needs a, like a starting page or a page to go, right, well, these are all the things I want to do. And mm. then you would then, you just do, a, was it a mind dump? It sounds a bit ungracious, but yeah. But my, And then chucked all that into one page and then just pull that into the other pages and see how you get on. Because mm. I'm finding that um, it's uh, an uneven delivered as it is right now, it's an uneven practice. It would be something I would be doing in the classroom with, mm. in a social environment. Um, ironically, for, for setting up people for their own individual needs, it needs a, a social aspect. Um, this is what I've found again, I think I've mentioned this, with these old classes where the focus is on sociability first. Yeah. And mm. everyone, and English, just literacy classes, people who can't read and write very well, full stop they're all in it together and it's an even ground mm. so i'm thinking that it it, it needs quite a, it's it's quite a nuanced um situation that may need not just one type of delivery but a couple so um that that always creates more problems for me because i go well what do i do <laughs> i'm gonna keep on create more complexity on something that's really simple or I think you, you were saying earlier as well that um, as as time has gone on with lockdowns and people's realizing that they need help in this area, that, that there's a certain amount of impatience that's coming through, um, that people may have been willing to be mm. patient and wait previously, and now they're getting less patient, um, which is a bit uh, difficult to hear. But it's if, it, if this is happening, then... Well, um, yeah. to be to be clear, it's not really too much from the individuals mm. uh, that I'm supporting. Um, I've had one lady the other day who phoned me up and said, "I really need you to have a look at my machine. It's doing weird things. I've only got half a screen. There wasn't half a screen. It was set on a high contrast mode, you know, and that has its issues." But I said, "Well, okay, I can't visit you." I'm not visiting anyone unless you you really have nothing and I need mm. to be there on site. I, I really don't visit. Mm. So she said, well, what happens and when things get worse and it will be <laughs> emotional blackmail. And I thought, well, okay, fair enough. So I remotely controlled the machine and resolved it. Like I say, I found out it was high contrast. Mm. Now this is individual, individual, he said, mumbling. Um, the other side of it is it's the organ, it's the, it's the organizations that are a little bit more impatient and really needing things a little bit now. Um, I'll not name no names, but, mm. um, but what happens is that they, they've sort of realized a little bit too late. They should have been doing something beforehand and now they're caught on the, on the back foot. Um, so uh, yeah, problematic. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really keen actually. And my, my attitude at the moment um is to actually have something that moves on through through and beyond the pandemic and adds a new layer to the situation. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's your good selves. May have mentioned this. It's a similar process. I would really like to see council meetings online. I would really like to be able to participate, even just in a chat. And we can't. We're meant to be able to publicly already, but we can't visit them. And I, I just thought it's like that similar sort of thing. We should be able to have things a little bit. Now we're moving towards this a little bit more. It should be an overlay that is that we can sit between and we're not. And, and this is my access side where you can have either or. That's really the, the I feel is the holy grail of all this, that we shouldn't be actually locked into one situation. We should be able to move between either. A lot of councils have have um, been broadcasting their meetings online for a long time, even before all the lockdowns started. But I think you're, you're talking about, Paul, is more about the actually be able to engage with what's going on, not just listen, not just be an observer. Is that what you mean? Yes, thank mm, you for yeah. clarification there. Um, yeah. I've, I've yet, well, I'd love to know, I'd love to be put wrong about my own council uh, broadcasting. I, that would really make my day. I'd like to be made wrong every now and again. But... Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's true. Um, a bit more, um, I think one of the issues, I don't want to get drawn into politics too much, but um, there is politics behind a lot of this, um, whereby what happens is that if 
people are drawn into individual little boxes, then what happens is that they, they feel powerless. And then what happens is that we, um, all sorts of other things, weird things happen as a result. And it's a really good way to actually draw our, um, ourselves into in, interacting with processes of, of local governance a lot more, especially when local councils are feeling the pinch. Um, much, I think yeah. it's really, uh, they, we, we, I know in South East London, the mutual aid uh, organisation that's the, the, the spread out, that just popped up were a boon to the local mm. councils because it was the blind spot that they never addressed. Yeah. Um, we've got a bit of an issue at the moment with the donation hub being closed by the local council as well, but that I'll not get into that contentious issue. But um, yeah, you, yeah I, I, I feel this is the way we move on uh, through all of this. It's not just shrinking ourselves into individual little pockets, but being able to help one another. Mm-hmm. Well, I won't, uh, I won't, wider yeah. I won't mention a specific parish council that's been occupying the airwaves greatly over the last <laughs> couple of weeks. And but on the other hand, Pauline, you have no authority here. <laughs> <laughs> a certain Pauline very well-known known, known lady. But um, I, I, I worry that things like that, because it gets popular exposure and memes and stuff, and people start to think, oh, that's, what it's, uh, that's what all parish councils are like that's what all councils are like and to some extent maybe there's some truth in it but not to a large extent there's lots of very well-meaning and hard-working people Absolutely. and good you know good well-informed people making helping make decisions and making things happen in their local areas like my one of my um local facebook groups is about patrolling the area and reporting on uh, uh, fly tipping and stuff like that and, and things get actually do get cleared up and that makes a big difference to people living in the local area so yeah. um, I would I would want to encourage people to get involved in the local de- democratic structures um, or while recognizing that there are some less than desirable things that happen but um, yeah I'd, I'd like well, to the see more, more people that get that. involved the less space there is for people like that really isn't it it's yeah it comes down to Definitely, more reasonable yeah. people that get well-meaning people that get involved the fewer spaces there are for the less space oh. there is for um yeah silly stuff i've i've tended to find that um that what happens is that the political skills and um goodwill don't tend to mix too well really mm. so, um you can start off with the best will in the world but then politics has its own agendas um so i've 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 just been a community gardener historically. I just try, just gone for one thing, just mm. just gardens. Yeah, I, I think, think um, the difference yeah. between parish and town level councils, and even the smallest district councils, that's a very big leap from one one thing to another, really. Because I think mm, most parish yeah. and town councils tend to be very community focused, uh, and but as soon as you get into the next tier up which is going to district or county and there's political parties involved, then that's a very difficult, a very different kettle of fish, really, generally speaking. Indeed. Mm. Yeah. Um, have uh, Online access can be a great equaliser, but it doesn't necessarily equalise in terms of skills or knowledge or how you deal with all of that. Um, Absolutely. Well, uh, you know. um, maybe we've got time, Swain, to look at a few of the stories that we picked up. Um, and Paul, you sure. feel free to comment on them as well. But the... Um, the first one was one I picked up just this morning about um, the final conference of the ICT Skills for All project, which is an Erasmus Plus project focused on developing digital skills of, of older people. And they, um, if you've got that first one there, um, Swain, it's age plat- age-platform.eu. Mm. The first, link, the first it. link on the grid, yeah. yeah. Which basically, the headline is older people are excluded from digital education, but fun can help bring them in. And I think this is um, partly the kind of things you try to encourage as well, Paul, um, saying basically the digital skills are a narrow concept and should be expanded to media literacy and accessibility. Um, and the, the author of this piece, uh, Philip Seidel, uh, explained why it's sometimes misleading to speak about lack of digital skills. Many older people learned how to use command lines in the past, but these skills are no longer relevant. Um, although many opportunities exist to use technologies for health and to improve communication, the lack of digital inclusion of older people is hindering their deployment, Note, noted both uh, our policy officer and the commission's representative at this event. Um, by digital exclusion, uh, Philippe 
meant a host of factors. Skills are important, but connectivity and financial accessibility are just as important. And furthermore, the accessibility of online tools for persons with disabilities is not a given in a context where many vital day-to-day -day services are moving online. And another important element, which we've also covered in this show previously, is trust in digital technologies. Uh, and they mentioned that abusive practices such as phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, are more and more sophisticated the multiplication of platforms and websites means it's more difficult to know what and, and who, I think, to trust. Um, so, yeah, uh, the Commission, MEPs and Microsoft were involved in this um, event as well. But I thought it was good to point out that, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to have fun when you're doing these things. We don't always want to do something meaning, you know, kind of uh, meaningful in a kind of a deep way. But sometimes we just want to have do a quiz or do a jigsaw or do something online that's just about entertainment and not well a lot of this is all life. around work yeah yeah <laughs> i mean computers is. are structured around an office good yeah goodness sake you know <laughs> so yes it, it's really useful to actually bring it out of that uh, environment into something that's a little bit more fun and approachable yeah one of the one of the um, my favorite apps at the moment is is duolingo because i'm i'm improving uh -huh. my irish language skills um, and although they try and keep um, upselling the, the, the paid for version of the app, there's still a lot of um, free uh, available stuff on the free version. Um, and I, it's nice for me to be finding my way back to a language that I learned when I was at school um, just by and, and a lot of uh, endorphin uh, releasing happening because I am succeeding and, you know, getting and they, they do points and everything the way most uh, good computer games uh, do. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, I've gone through the bronze, silver and gold um, leagues and now I'm in the Sapphire League, which is oh, oh. Very, very nice, to, very nice to be part of. Very nice. Yeah. Um, so another story we had and it's been um, we, we kind of looked at it a, a couple of weeks ago and I didn't get back to it. But it was one of those Leeds ones because Leeds does, t does tend to be doing great things around online stuff. Um, the Arts, Health and Wellbeing Network, uh, we're compiling a list of, again, as we say, entertain, entertaining things, arts and culture for health and well-being. Um, they, they do point out it's not a complete list, but they re list resources uh, to give a sense of what's on offer online to enable people to connect with, uh, with each other through arts and cult culture, obviously with a particular emphasis on leads, um, supporting mental health, well-being, and connecting to and communicating with others and uh, managing specific health conditions. Again, I don't know if you've got that one up on screen, um, Swain. Just coming, yep. Yep, okay. And um, uh, they're talking about engaging in... Hang on, I need to get back to my own screen now. Engaging in arts and culture remotely and yet and online is yet to be proven to have the same benefits um, and we know from, they know from talking to people in Leeds that taking the first step in joining a group of people can be very difficult, but the benefits can be huge from developing a sense of belonging to creating a routine to be able to do things as a group. We can't do on our own and introducing new experiences and perspectives. And they have found that different people have joined in online activities compared to people who attended face to face activities. Mm -hmm. So that might be a benefit to um, some people. And we would encourage people to keep investigating those lots of Cultural uh, organizations are um, developing their online offer now as well. Um, so you can do virtual tours and so on. And as we discover them, we'll, we'll bring them to you. Um, and then the next story was about um, the UN Commission for Social Development. Um, hashtag CSOCD59, which isn't, um, doesn't well, spring to mind. Well, rolls but... off the tongue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that one. It does when you when you think about it, maybe. Um, but this was the 59th session um, of the Commission for Social Development, which took place from the 8th to the 17th of February. So it's still going on at the UN HQ in, in New York. And their priority theme was um, a socially just transition towards sustainable development and the role of digital technologies on social development and the well-being of all. And I think it's just... Um, we like to think on this show about not just the the local but the global um digital inclusion um so it's good to know that we're kind of um doing things that other people are doing around the world as well um and we hope that we're all um you know kind of increasing our knowledge and help for people the next story was um about alexa and amazon echo and how they help disabled people and this was actually a story from 2016 oh. which i thought was a bit dated but actually i think it's good Again, talking about the kind of basic things that we, some of us take for granted, but um, it's not 
as as uh, intuitive for, for everybody. So I thought it was useful just to say, give a list of how some people are using Alexa and Amazon Echo. And this is a blind person writing for abilitynet.org.uk um, and offering their current favorite requests at that time were getting the news from Alexa um, just by saying, Alexa, give me the news. Um, Alexa, asking for facts. Alexa, how tall is the queen? Or give me a random fact. Uh, tell me a joke. I, I love this one. I, oh, I, I, I ask one. this one a lot. Yeah, Alexa, tell me a joke. Um, and I, I do I do enjoy those from time to time. Timers and alarms, also very useful. Uh, set a timer for three minutes or wake me up at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, not always, not everybody enjoys those, but it is good if you, if you want them. Um, radio, this is another one I find very useful, especially for, uh, I listen to Irish radio, uh, as you would imagine. So I um, I have to make sure I say it right, though, because Alexa doesn't always, uh, isn't always able to interpret what I want. So I, I say, Alexa, please play RT Radio 1. That's my uh, radio station from Ireland. Um, uh, and other people can pl play other things. And on my phone, I find um, sometimes... Uh, I have an Alexa app as well, and they I, I can ask for you know play a play some you know uh, gentle music or something. And yesterday I had a, a, a playlist of chill chill music to chill to. So um, it's good to to know that Alexa can do that for you as well. There's a couple of more things on this suggestion list, which is about podcasts and books as well. Play Radio Player One on Audible. So if I think I don't know where you need to be linked to your uh, audible on your if there needs to be a link there but if if, if there is somebody will tell us that i think and then um, this oh on, sorry Paul. Colleen. go on um i was just going to put in there but I, I, I really quite like the uh, alexa dot and um I, I i regretted asking what it was one day i actually said to it alexa what are you and it stumbled a few times and then burst into song with with the end line, I can bust a rhyme. I was really, <laughs> I was taken aback. But I think, <laughs> but what it is, I think the, the the I think one thing that Robin is the main man in uh, AbilityNet, and mm. uh, I, he's very 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 competent. And I think what it is that there's a whole bunch of people out there that wouldn't have a smartphone to set up an Alexa unit. That's yeah. the real. That's the gotcha. Yeah. Uh, that is the gotcha. You have to have that app to set it up to be able to use it. Yeah. After that's set up, um, this is the hurdle for more, most of issues around disability I've found is just the setting up itself. So I think brilliant, get on with using it, but it's the setting up that's the problem. Very good, very point. Well made. Thanks, Paul. Um, yes, and we will uh, still be encouraging people to to do to, to use it, but also to, to be aware that not everybody has it. But for those who do have it, and we would uh, you know be encouraging it. Um, then the next story was about uh, a, a daily five minute echo demo from Alexa, and this was kind of going back to equipping the early early adopters, if you like, with um, some tools that they they might find of useful. I just came across this this morning. Um, so if you do, and they've got 999 episodes, so plenty to choose from there. So you do, if you do have an Alexa, this, these are different ways to be able to use it and people do different ways people are using it. And it's kind of five to eight minutes slot um, of different things. So, I mean, I think I'll, I'll, be, I'll be wandering through that for the rest of the week, mm. um, listening to various things there. I hope they're well indexed so that, you know, it makes it easy to find what they are, but you're just... Uh, Swain's just scro scrolling through it on screen now. We've got Submarine Adventure, Security Siren and Siren Alarm, Harry Potter Quiz, bound to be um, bound to be popular. Um, Monster Garden, Nightlight, The Daily Question, A Lady, what is your free audio book this month? So there could be Daybreak Yoga. Yoga. I mean, there. It sounds like very convincing kind of things that people might might want to get involved in and the, these devices are quite cheap so mm. um yeah let's let's keep encouraging people but recognizing as paul says that not not everybody's going to have the tech just yet um and there was one i don't know if we got time for one more um swain we're kind of running yeah, out of time but we're yeah this is the uh, flincher library is running still running great free online learning sessions and there was a series of just posters. Um, I think you've got the a different oh, one the up there. Um, yeah, this is Flincher Library. 
Um, and they're just doing posters of the kind of things that the library is still able to offer online. Um, no, no, still haven't got the right one up yet, one but no. um, yeah, that's okay. Um, uh, and just saying that libraries are still able to offer a certain amount of um, stuff online. Uh, let me see, I've got it up myself. Okay, so that's the tweet there. Um, where they are offering, oh, that's in Welsh, and that's in Welsh. Would you like to access Zoom activities but don't know how? Aura Libraries can help and support you to gain confidence using Zoom so you can offer groups and activities, and they're offering support starting today by by telephone, which I think was a good good thing to remind people you can still mm. consult some libraries by telephone. Um, Just like you can still use a pen, you can still use a telephone. You can. Yeah. Aura uh, Libraries can help and support you to gain confidence and get online using a PC, tablet, or laptop. And they're offering a free six-week course for people in the area to um, to use a tablet or laptop. So I think some good stuff there um, to end on. Um, thanks again, Paul, for joining us today. And um, wish you good luck with your uh, endeavours. And please do let us know how you're getting on. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today on the Dr. Tech Show Tech Talk. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us on drtechshow at gmail.com or call Hope Radio in Birmingham or email brumcommunitymedia at gmail.com. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a great week. <laughs>